welcome to Bachtoberfest on A Moment of Bach, our season three closer episode. We are your hosts, Alex and Christian Giebert, and we're here to celebrate our listeners and the music of Bach and close out our season with a special episode like we've done for the last three years now. Christian, big news right up top. Last week, we talked about wanting to crest that 100K episode download hill. And thanks to you, our listeners, we have, according to my stats here, we have 100,890, mm-hmm. so almost 101K downloads. That's amazing. So listeners, especially if you were one of the ones who told a friend or family member about the podcast, thank you for helping us grow. I'm very pleased to watch all of the statistics like what countries we're being listened to in. We know that it's real because we get messages from these people from all over the world, and that's amazing. It's only 44, 45% United States listenership. Less than half. So today, besides reading some listener comments, we also want to focus on, as we've done for the last two Bachtoberfests, a silly piece by Bach. Season 1 Bachtoberfest, we chose... The Coffee Cantata. Season 2, we looked at the Quadlibet, which has hilariously silly text in a pretty funny performance. And this year, we'll look at another cute little piece, an arrangement by Bach of a song, So oft ich meine Tobak's Pfeife. So oft ich meine Tobak's Pfeife so Christian, what were your immediate thoughts in reaction to this unusual piece by Bach? I, I just love the sillier Bach because we don't think of him that way generally. Sometimes yeah. I, the first when I hear something like this, I first think like, how how did this? When did he squeeze this one in? You know, like when was this for? What was this for? But then, of course, like the message of it is that the pipe is made of earth and blackened as it is used and it kind of ends up just being a religious sort of lutheran thing in the end like a sort of live carefully because your life is fragile there's even an analogy about about hell in there yeah it's kind of like the book of ecclesiastes yeah 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 and so on ash wednesday in lutheranism in catholicism and a lot of different denominations you get a text on Ash Wednesday that says, From dust you came, and to dust you shall return, and is a reminder of your mortality, right? Mm-hmm. From Genesis. And it's actually Genesis 3, which is the, the part with God talking to Adam and Eve and the snake after the humans have disobeyed him. This is part of the curse laid on mankind, right? And, and it is kind of silly, the way that this text uses a pipe to depict this. And the silliness is evident in the performance here. It's a great little performance by the bass soloist Dominic Werner, and kind of theatrical. He takes a little wooden pipe and sings about it. So the translation of the text in the first verse of this song, which, which probably wasn't written by Bach, right? I mean, that would be very unlikely that the text was written by him. Mm-hmm. It may have just been some folk song in general. Maybe not, but whenever I take my pipe and stuff it and smoke to pass the time away, my thoughts, as I sit and puff it, dwell on a picture sad and gray. It teaches me that very like am I myself unto my pipe. Then the rest of the verses are different ways in which the singer is like his pipe. <laughs> It is only made of earth and clay and will return to the ground after it breaks, okay? Also, the pipe's white color reminds the singer of the fact that after we die, our skin turns more pale. And then the fire and the ash inside the pipe reminds the singer that her body will turn to dust. And then the best part is in the fourth verse, where sometimes when you poke your finger into around there into the bowl of the pipe and the and it's hot in there still, and it hurts your finger. And it's like, if that's hot, 
then how much hotter must be the flames of hell, you know? <laughs> and like, that's some dark humor. Oh, macht die Kohle solche Pein? Wie heiß mag erst die Hölle sein? So Ecclesiastes, even though it's not actually quoted here, is the book that I think of with this stuff, right? Probably one of the most pessimistic books of the Bible if you're taking it on emotional reaction. This is how the book of Ecclesiastes starts. It says, The words of the teacher, son of David, king in Jerusalem. Meaningless. Meaningless, says the teacher. Utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. Then it goes on to talk about how everything you do gets forgotten. All the achievements you make will crumble. All that. It's just... If you really want to go on an emotional roller coaster, you got to read Ecclesiastes because the whole, it's not that the whole thing is so depressing. It actually kind of wraps up with a hopeful note. But I kind of look at this uh, this tobacco song here as a little bit of a cut from the same cloth. There, it's definitely the most like philosophical of the books of the Bible. Yeah, and it was written by Solomon, which is the son of David that was talked about there, a person known for his wisdom, right? Mm-hmm. Ecclesiastes in the third chapter, everything is meaningless, everything goes to the same place. All come from dust, and to dust all return. So that's quoting Genesis there, of course. So in this recording, we get what is a very simple arrangement by Bach of this song. So this is from Notebook for Anna Magdalena Bach. It, it could be that this was by one of the sons of Bach, maybe Gottfried Heinrich Bach. But either way, it's probably... Like, it could, it could be written by him. It might not be. It might be a folk song. It could be just an arrangement. And if it was just an arrangement, then really all it is is a bass line to the melody, mm-hmm. which a continual player would have filled in above anyway, but Bach wouldn't have bothered to write out that realization anyway. This also existed in a transposed version. There are two versions of this, of this little aria. One of them is in the bass range and the other in the tenor. And the Netherlands Black Society has the recording of the other one as well, if you want to check that out. Zu Land, zu Wasser und zu Haus. Mein Pfeifchen stets in Andacht. Aus. So, Christian, in our previous years, we've enjoyed a German beverage on Oktoberfest as is appropriate, right? Mm-hmm. It's a nice fall day here in Southern California. It's uh, like 95 degrees outside. Uh, yeah. Or 92. That's like 30, that'd be like 33, 34 Celsius for our international listeners. Yeah. On, in uh, October. The beer that we got, Schifferhofer, which is a grapefruit Hefeweizen. I don't know if you remember, Christian, we had the same beer last year. And I would have liked to have gotten something different this year, but uh, this was the only German beer at the store. (laughs) So that's what I got. (laughs) So cheers. Okay, so YouTube. We've become aware that some people do use YouTube to listen to this podcast. And uh, so I haven't responded to all of you if you've made a comment yet. We also noticed, frustratingly, that some of the YouTube episodes did not automatically upload like they were supposed to. Same goes for Facebook. So if that's the way you get this content, you're missing a few episodes. We're working on it. So then also, Alex, last year at Bachtoberfest, I mentioned that I was putting on a Bach cantata as part of my Christmas carol festival at the church where I'm the director of music. We're doing that again. Uh, this time I'm doing Cantata 40, a short version of that cantata, Dazu ist erschienen. Put that in the, the date and location in the show notes if you happen to be local. And we did an episode on that cantata a while back. We've done two now. Oh, yeah. I think it would be fun to hear from the listeners what kind of Bach events they're going to go to over this next few months, maybe the Christmas season, or maybe even if you're involved in performing. I'd like to hear from you. What will you be seeing and hearing with Bach 
over this break period before the next year. We've had some really great communication with our listeners this year, sharing cool stuff with us and giving us suggestions of moments of Bach to cover in the future. We have a backlog of those, so if you've sent one in, we'll get to it eventually. Linda Giebert, who is our aunt, shared with us this quote from composer-organist Max Rager. Bach is the beginning and end of all music. That's quite a thing to say, but if it was going to be said about someone, I guess it would be him. Yeah, and it makes sense coming from Rieger, who is someone who really admired Bach, of course, and whose music is very, like, contrapuntally complex, mm-hmm. and who who famously wrote for the organ, which, of course, is one of Bach's big instruments. Also, I like that quote because it kind of ties into the stuff that we talked about regarding Bach and his place in music history. We got a little more in-depth with that particular topic on our episode from Season 2, on the Et Resurrexit from the Mass in B minor. We talked about Bach being this terminal point as a composer. We quoted Albert Schweitzer on that, whose perspective from the early 20th century was a little different than what we have now, but who still saw Bach, I think, in a pretty useful, in a way that's pretty useful to use as a framework for Bach's place in the pantheon of music history. What's the quote by Steve Reich about Bach? You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. See if I can find it. Oh, yeah. Steve Reich, the minimalist composer of the late 20th century, said, For me, music history basically begins with Gregorian chant and then goes to the end of 1750 with the death of Johann Sebastian Bach. (laughs) Then (laughs) it goes on without me paying much attention until Debussy, Ravel, Stravinsky, Bartok, and so on. The entire classical and romantic period is filled with geniuses that I don't listen to and from whom I've learned absolutely nothing. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and I mean, that tracks with what, what we know about him as a composer. And to be honest, I, I resonate with that a little bit. We've talked about this before, Christian, but mm-hmm. I think Mozart is incredible and had a good ear for and sense for fugue and counterpoint. I'm lower on Beethoven than most people. I think he's fine. I think Schubert is in the same place as him. I think some of the other romantic Brahms, Tchaikovsky are better for different reasons too, in my mind. Mahler and Bruckner occupy a bit of a higher spot. I could almost lose anything else. But earlier, back thinking back to Mozart, I could almost lose anything else besides Mozart in that era. I don't find much enjoyment from Haydn. It's just all a little too fluffy for me. Hmm. And and then, like what Steve Reich says, I get really excited once Debussy starts to push out of the romantic mold. I love impressionistic music, whether it's French or just French inspired, but it's almost all inspired by the French. I get lost in Ravel in a good way. Uh, Just loving the feeling of swimming in that music and not really staying afloat. It's a lot more fun for me as a, as a listener than listening to Haydn, for example. I don't know what what it is, if it's just that as soon as the capital C classical era begins, that a certain amount of personality is in the music, or if the simplicity of the elegance of it is too simple, or certainly by the romantic period, the the like composer ego is so involved, that stuff is just kind of new, and it doesn't last for me either. Yeah, it's it has a lot to do with this sort of zeitgeist, right? Like, that romantic era super duper humanistic all about the the artist's soul and that that whole thing just doesn't resonate with me at all i much prefer bach and music that's written for a purpose like church it doesn't have to be religious either i just much prefer the sort of music that isn't so full of itself you know Hmm. that's definitely true of steve reich whose music just sort of emerges as it goes yeah He's a living composer, too, by the way. He's, I think, 87. So here's a message from Felix. Felix has become a fan in a short time, and Felix is an amateur oboist who played the Mass in B minor. Uh, I think it must have been last year now. Felix goes on to say, Can we make an episode about the Confiteor, the movement before the Et Expecto? After all these years, to my ears, it is one of the most miraculous movements, especially the last few bars towards the Ed Expecto, where Bach pulls out all the stops. 
how Bach leads the listener from three sharps to four flats within two bars into another world. This et expecto bridge full of dizzying modulations. The world turns upside down. Reality tilts. Life becomes death becomes life. Twenty-six inimitable bars. I know it is one of my father's favorite moments. So take a pause right there to say that that the listener who has listened to every episode knows that we did get to this moment. It was also suggested by our listener John. But the real bonus information here is that our listener Felix van Veltoven shared with us one of his father's favorite moments. So I'll let I'll let our listeners put together with that if they recognize that name. Nice. How does that sound? <laughs> yeah. It is, I mean, it's like the moment of Bach, right? I think mm-hmm. we said that in the episodes that we talked about it. If you were to really nail down like the top five famous moments of Bach where the specific moment was famous, it's got to be on there. Yeah. It'd be that. Maybe the Gottes Zeit pause. Yep. Certainly the, the one we just did last week with Giovanni. Yes, the prelude from that lute from BWV 98 for Lute. And then probably maybe the beginning of Toccata and Fugue, even though that's not really the moment that I chose back then when we did that episode, I chose the end. Probably. That's just a really famous opening, you know, the diminished chord. Yeah, and then are we talking about the level of fame of the moment or are we talking about the level of weirdness of the moment? Because in that Ihr werdet weinen und heulen, we have one of the weirdest moments that there is in Baroque music. It's true. But it's not incredibly... Yeah famous of a cantata even that's yeah though it should be because it's the strangest one well yeah it becomes once you start thinking about it it becomes too hard to to pick five because what about the ending of some of those choral movements in Jesu Meine Freude Motet or what about the yeah the death part of St. Matthew Passion or a couple other moments like the Barabbas moment or the Son of God moment. St. Matthew Passion is full of those. The crucify him moment. It's just, it's all over the place. Speaking of these large works and returning to moments from similar sections, we have a message from Rich. He says he was driving his kids ages 11 and 12 home from school and they didn't say a word. And then they were naturally curious and the whole time they were just trying to tell our voices apart, apparently. <laughs> oh, that's great. But Rich's suggestion, he says, I realize you have already done an episode about the first Kyrie for the Mass in B minor and are unlikely to want to do a repeat, but here is my favorite moment in any case. So I won't give it away because I want to do this moment, but the answer to the question of whether we would consider that, I think we absolutely will. There's no rule. We haven't done it yet. We haven't returned to the same movement of the same piece and done a second moment. But even before we started the podcast, I always knew that we could do that. We're not limiting ourselves in that way. So yeah, I think we will absolutely add this to the list. Yeah, that's a good idea. It's a cool moment that he talks about too. We got a great message from Thierry talking about a moment of Cantata 60 with a famous S. East Genug moment where the melody of the chorale itself outlines a dissonant tritone interval and in fact the original tune does do that and we have proof of that from Thierry's message and also Thierry if I'm pronouncing your name correctly has a sort of an online discussion thing uh, that's I think a in-person meetup every once in a while but also it has an online component where they talk about the group talks about cantatas that fall on that Sunday or that time oh how do I join that? <laughs> That's cool. The, oh, yeah, let's link it. Whoa, yeah, I just listened to the S. Iskinung thing. <laughs> yeah. That's the first four notes of that. It's just, whoa. Yeah. 
And that, that's the, the melody actually is that. So it's not that he edited part of that. It's one of those things that like technically it's following the rules, but how often do melodies start starting on the tonic note and just go up one, two, three, four, with a sharp four. So it's just a whole tone scale. And then end there at the end of that. That's the end of the line. Just four notes. And just hanging on that sharp. It's weird. Mm-hmm. Here's a message from Darcy who says, My favorite aspect of your podcast that is unique to your podcast is how you explain and break down all the musical theory information and technical terms to a basic level I can understand. On a side note, my teenage son and I were playing around with the cheap plastic recorders they got in second grade school, mm-hmm. and we tried to play the dual recorder part of the beginning of the Actus Tragicus Cantata. Nice. We were awful. Even the dog left the room. We were <laughs> laughing so hard, my cheeks hurt. It was a priceless moment with my son that we will never forget. Our own moment of Bach. How great is that? That's great. I love that. That's so heartwarming. Here's a message from JG, who linked a 20,000 Hertz episode, which is a podcast about sort of all things audio engineering related and sound related it's a great podcast i used to listen to it a lot uh, but it's still going an episode on the voyager golden record which listener if you don't know when the voyager spacecraft were one and two were launched into space they contained a physical record on them as sort of a collection of music from earth in case apparently some aliens found it i guess and it's called the voyager golden record music from earth and there are three Bach pieces on there. There's the first movement of the Brandenburg Concerto number two in F. There's a partita number three in E major for violin, the Gavotte, I think. And then there's a well tempered clavier book two, Glenn Gold, not not actually a harpsichord, but Glenn Gold on the piano. And uh, Prelude and Fugue in C number one, not the whole well tempered clavier. I think that would probably have taken up the whole <laughs> record. And those pieces of metal are billions of miles away from the earth and they contain box music on them and i just think that's really weird and strange and wonderful from instagram riley asks if we could talk about lobet gott in seinen reichen and you're right riley the netherlands box society has not released a recording yet this is the ascension cantata so oh that's a great one i conducted that one a few years ago i was gonna say i'm sure alex has a lot to say about it i think we will absolutely do that once it comes out yeah we know the christmas oratorio must be soon on its way because we heard that elise went to it Hmm. last year nice listener michael has a suggestion here after mentioning that his favorite has always been bach since before he can remember his mother told him once that she remembers that he liked bach as early as two years old Hmm. love that he says I'd love it if you could extend your season by one more week next year and cover All Saints Day. I love the connection between Bach and Luther. And all week I've been listening to Ein Festeburg ist unser Gott by the Netherlands Bach Society. It's a BWV 80, I'm pretty sure is what Michael is talking about. And have been imagining Bach preparing it for this Sunday. So that's a great suggestion and we should definitely do that. I would say next year, even if we don't extend that far, when we might, we could. But even if we don't, we should still do that cantata. It's a great recording, too, of course. And, you know, as Lutheran church workers, Christian and I are very familiar with A Mighty Fortress is Our God. We do it a lot, especially right, right around the end of October or beginning of November, of course. Mm-hmm. Yes. Unfortunately, we didn't make it to that Sunday in our season, but that doesn't mean we can't talk about it in our one of our episodes. Yeah. yeah. They also just dropped, Netherlands Box Society also just dropped another cantata that looks like it's from that same concert which is Nundaket alle Gott. oh now thank we all are god yeah yeah which has a similar like triumphant feel as a cantata speaking of triumphant feels listener john who suggested who was one of our listeners who suggested the bridge between confiteor and et expecto had two more suggestions as well hmm. one of them is the pleni sunt celli from the sanctus of the mass in b minor yep nice John was profoundly moved by the section, which struck him as an ecstatic dance. I love that description. Well, and just the word painting is just yeah. so exquisite. Yeah. And um, it's, a, it's a feeling that does not fade, says John. 
and number two, incarnatus est from the Mass in B minor as well. So yeah, again, the word painting. Yeah, yeah, those are definitely on the list. And then a request from Fergus for cantata number 35, which we can do because it is released and we haven't covered it yet. Oh yeah, that's a great one. That's the alto solo cantata with the organ obligato stuff. Mm -hmm. Really heavy organ feature in that one. Yep. Yeah, We've got two suggestions from Santiago. There's the Takata in E minor BWV 914. The Netherlands Box Society has released it, so that's good. And also one from the C minor fugue from the first book of the World Templed Clavier. By the way, listeners, if you suggest something that has not been released by the Netherlands Box Society, we usually can't do it yet, but we keep it on a list and we just wait patiently. Although we might have to wait years until they do release it. Yeah. A suggestion from David for the chromatic passage from BWV 656 Olam Gottes Unschuldig. That's surely a moment. A suggestion from Elia from Germany. A Moment of Bach is my favorite podcast. Thank you for your insights and dedication. Oh. I would love for you to review the fugue from BWV 849. That's on our list as well. A suggestion from HG for the slow second movement of the Italian concerto and the bass line of that. And no, we haven't talked about that at all to answer this listener's question. And then from our friend Charlie, who is an organist, some suggestions, one from BWB 542, a sequential moment around the circle of fifths, I think is, where that, is what that is. Mm. And then the Kyrie eleison part of the hymn harmonizations from 671, particularly 669 through 671 but the end of the verse ends with like a Kyrie section those are really cool oh yeah yeah you said you said that was charlie that suggested that one too yep yeah charlie performed all of the clavier übung book three. Oh really yeah which is a huge feat if any organists out there will know how difficult some of that music is one in particular uh one of these six part fugues I think it's BWV 686, if I'm looking at this correctly. Just extraterrestrially difficult. <laughs> we have a message from Edwin here. It says, I've really enjoyed the podcast. I was wondering, and I know this might sound sacrilegious, but have you ever considered doing a moment of a different composer just to show a contrast or influence, either by or from Bach? For example, a moment of Heinrich Schutz's St. John Passion is an early example of what a passion used to be. It's a cool idea. Compared to a similar passage in Bach's St. John Passion. It's a great idea. I love that. All we have to do is make sure we can get the rights to play the music from the other composer. And Netherlands Bach Society has done some things from other composers anyway. But we could also try and secure rights from another group. As long as we can do that, we could do something cool like that. It could definitely be in our future. Mm -hmm. We absolutely do not have the, a rule where every episode has to be Bach. And even this one, it would be a comparison anyway. We've, we've done the arrangement of Vivaldi for the four harpsichords piece. It was Bach's arrangement, but the music was Vivaldi. Right. But also, I'm not against just doing a, taking a special episode to do something else. Okay, well, that about concludes our listener comment section. And almost signing off here for Moment of Box Season 3. Just a couple more things to say. First is that you can expect two bonus episodes pretty soon. And one of those, like we like to do, is a blooper reel from the previous season. As you probably figured out, Christian and I edit this podcast and skip a lot of the uh, a lot of the stupid mistakes that we make, basically. <laughs> and <laughs> But we save some of the funnier ones. So we'll give that to you as a bonus episode, as is our tradition. And then our second bonus episode will be a little post-concert chat with soprano Emily Wood, who we had as a guest a little bit earlier in this season when we talked about the coffee cantata with her. She sang soprano, an amazing aria, on BWV 147, Herz und Mund und Tat und Leben, concert that we just did at my church just this last week and right after the concert we set up our mics and had a little interview with emily so that'll be a bonus episode that you can expect but other than that a moment of bach will not light up your podcast app for a while uh, that is until the last week of february we'll be back 
and we'll start that season with a cantata that I already alluded to a little bit today, which is BWV 192, Non Dunket Alle Gott, a cantata which just was released by Netherlands Box Society. So we plan on returning with that episode on February 26th. Until next time, until next year, enjoy those moments. (laughs) 